Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to start by thanking Dr. Tadeo and uh, Lieutenant Glorioso for inviting me to speak on cyber weaponry and to partake of these critical discourses. And of course, a thanks to NATO, to, uh, NATO CCD, COE, and Oxford host for hosting us. Just a quick but necessary disclaimer. Uh, the comments I make today and views and perspectives I share are um, made in my own personal capacity and not necessarily those of the U.S. Army, Department of Defense, uh, U.S. government, my Aunt Nancy, or uh, the Galactic Empire, or what have you. Uh, I look forward to a provocative discussion and hope it will extend beyond the bounds of this conference. Much like my colleagues that just preceded me, um, this is all about uh, fostering and engendering a robust discourse that doesn't always happen within government and policy circles. So I, I encourage you to um, please share your ideas and thoughts. Uh, cyber weapons. So um, cyber weapons are as yet undefined. Um, really, the idea of cyber weapons in law, ethics, and policy um, are just as inchoate as the norms around the internet itself. So we need to start with a thorough, oh, just want to make sure I'm technically okay. Yep, okay, sorry. So we need to start with a thorough appraisal of what makes this domain different, and not just as a war fighting domain. We need to properly appreciate how these critical differences will affect norm formation going forward about the internet generally. Um, there are a core set of ways I shall discuss um, later on that evince how this domain is different. Uh, if I had to summarize that one overarching conclusion, it's that the internet renders porous what was once opaque, and I'll explain that a little um, later. So upon understanding this, how this domain is different, it will become crystal clear why we need a nuanced, internationally recognized definition of what precisely constitutes a cyber weapon. Um, and not just as government professionals or academics or lawyers or military officers, ethicists, scientists, technologists, but, as, um, uh, but for all netizens um, of, and, and citizens of the internet, uh, internet generally. So while imprecision in this lexicon is something that plagues cyber war discourses, not having a definition for cyber weaponry has proven to be quite an impediment and not just in terms of war fighting within the law of armed conflict, but in terms of internet go governance and stewardship, stewardship issues that we really should, as a global community, start to coherently develop. And um, I thank my colleagues for, for they essentially gave a great int introduction, um, the folks who just preceded me. This um, is a very important dialogue and we have to start somewhere and I see that they've already started some very robust thinking in that regard. So, Sorry, I keep touching the keyboard. <laughs> my research for this workshop's initiatives, initiatives have dovetailed nicely with um, part of what I do for my agency, which is anticipate critical emerging trends, whether geopolitical, legal, strategic, um, or grand strategic, uh, and looking at wicked multidisciplinary problems, and look at the aerial view and long view of these issues beyond just the modern war fighting moment that sometimes needs a myop myopic yes or no answer. Um, and I argue that all of these quandaries um, we're presented with today, um, no issue perhaps demands as much rigorous, reflexively and hopefully ritualized foresight as much as cyber war and cyber conflict specifically and internet governance norms generally. So with the internet, what I want to submit to you is that the past is not prologue. You hear that a lot, especially um, in US government circles. The issue actually here, patience is prologue. Um, and I'll get into that a bit later. So let's start with my institution. Um, how does the Department of Defense define cyber weapons? It's very simple. It doesn't. <laughs> uh, it actually recognizes the lack thereof. And um, basically, the U.S. Department of Defense, while recognizing the utility of cyber as a warfighting domain and the need to vigilantly defend its networks, recognizes the dearth of an international consensus here. And that cyber weaponry, however we eventually define it, is often inherently dual use, as my um, colleague Professor Rowe um, discussed earlier. In other words, even everyday tools and platforms that we use for benign and neutral purposes can potentially be weaponized. And it's a matter of public record that the US um, is developing cyber offensive capabilities. So let's take a step back. 
In cyber, what you'll find is a resort to analogizing to kinetic warfare, however imperfect that methodology can be, and I'm not always a fan of it. And uh, it's indeed replete with flaws, and I'll dis discuss that a little later. Um, and, uh, and the reason why we shouldn't always resort to kinetic uh, traditional warfare ana analogies is we will perpetuate even more legal, definitional, semantic, and strategic blind spots and inadequacies. And I think part of the problem here is that lawyers uh, tend to dominate this discussion, at least sa stateside. And, um, and, and though I'm legally trained, I love lawyers, uh, and recognize the importance of uh, lawyers in this discourse, the community tends to reason by analogy. And it's a very precedent-driven or orthodoxy. So that's actually an obstacle for many of the new challenges that cyber presents, um, which are patently orthogonal to the precedents that we've had before in use and bellow. Okay, so this is the best metaphor I could think of when I try to explain to some of the four stars at the Pentagon <laughs> why some of our analogies are not working when, it, when we try to analogize to cyber, I mean, kinetic warfare. Many aspects of the cyber platform are in fact unprecedented and don't overlap neatly with the newer forms of extraterritorial kinetic conflict. And I, I submit that we need to simply accept that as a foundational starting point. Um, quit fighting the new implications of the technology uh, without resorting to the techno panic that scholar Miriam Dunn Cavalty um, describes or has termed it. And just devise new innovative solutions that may be divergent from our safer kinetic based analogies. That said, I'm not in the camp of people who think cyber is so new and so unprecedented that we should devise an entirely new legal regime to, cont to contend with it, um, as many scholars and journalists and the internet commentariat sometimes um, advocate. What cyber does on a grand scale is something that many new types of conflict have already bu begun to do. Um, that is, expose the lacun lacuna in the law and inconsistency in the law that would have probably gotten, we probably would have gotten away with dismissing up until this point. But it's understandably a starting point to analogize to kinetic and tangible weapons, that which we can see. So let's look at the definition of a weapon under the international humanitarian law regime. Um, an, under additional protocol one of the Geneva Conventions of 1949, the definition of weapon, generally speaking, is quite expansive. A weapon, means, or method of warfare. So this doesn't necessarily help us either, in part because the drafters didn't receive that memo that one isn't supposed to use the very word one is attempting to define within its definition. But this expansive, broad definition ensures, um, in, all in all seriousness, that the nation, um, nation states that are prosecuting, prosecuting wars or preparing for potential wars must carefully weigh the legal ramifications and pitfalls of developing and acquiring possibly new weapons, including cyber, um, and anything with inherently um, or potential military applications. So while we understand that we need to review these new techniques for compliance with the law, we don't always have a handle on what it is we're supposed to review for compliance when it comes to cyber. Uh, let's take a moment to truly understand that there have already been treatises like the Talon Manual, um, and a bevy opinio of opinio juris within the legal community dedicated to cyber warfare and the ethical and legal um, ramifications of cyber warfare and uh, what constitutes a cyber attack. And through all of this, we have yet to define the instruments of attack. So even as this dialogue begins in earnest, there'll be accusations that this all amounts to al alarmism that there are lawns, uh, lines being drawn in the sand, that nation states are trying to control and militarize the internet. And I'm not saying there's not merit to that. Um, that that's something hopefully we can discuss a little later because uh, though the internet has, uh, not a lot of people know, especially within the hacker community, that the internet started with DARPA. It has a very decidedly military provenance. But in any event, um, it's not always, as, as soon as a robust discourse gets going, like the talent manual, you, you don't always have the best fans. So, oh, I think I skipped over <laughs> this slide. So this is, this is one example, this was just last week, I think, 
the PLA Diaries uh, response to the Talon Manual. It was, I think it's a little belated <laughs> considering how long ago um, it was released, but it was described as an effort to manipulate cyberspace using law. So they're pretty unhappy with it. They don't use the term lawfare. Um, people who, uh, who are familiar with lawfare know that this is kind of what you do. You sort of manipulate the law to fit how you're prosecuting a certain war to give a very rudimentary definition. So this is effectively what they're accusing drafters of the Talon Manual of doing. Just by having a discourse, there's no force of law here. It's a treatise, but there are already, there's already some pretty intense pushback. Uh, and that's not even getting into the uh, internet commentary at talking about, you know, the, we're gonna drone bomb hackers and all this other hysterical, all these other hysterical conclusions that, are, um, that were inspired by it. So this is kind of the problem with anything that has to do with the internet. And as my colleagues previously discussed, the uh, multi-stakeholders involved, the different interests, the different, you know, even within one government agency, you've got different echo chambers and your own nomenclature, your own lexicon. So expand that to the internet. And it's, it's incredible how hard it is to get everybody around the same table. Anyway, so here we have um, treatises, we have all, the, all this going on, all this discussion being ginned up, and we have nation states actively preparing cyber warriors in cyber defense and stockpiling offensive to, uh, tools, and all this is still just a drop in the bucket, globally speaking. Uh, but we have yet to actually define the instruments of attack that would propagate an actual cyber war. And by the way, whether that hypothetical war is entirely cyber, which is still a sort of conflict that needs to ripen into full potential. Um, it's, it's, there, there's a lot of debate that goes on in the legal and uh, war fighting community about, well, we'll never actually have a full on cyber war. It's, it's always gonna be paired with kinetic attack. I think, I, I don't waste time in my research for this workshop um, making a distinction between those kinds of wars because nobody ever says we're only gonna have a purely naval sea power type of war, or we're gonna have a purely air, pa why are we drawing lines in the sand about that? I feel like there's a lot of hair splitting that people waste time on, so I set that aside. Um, in any event, we have a general understanding of the domain. It's the first man-made terrain, for one. For instance, my institution defines the cyber domain thus. The networks and systems that make up cyberspace are man-made, often privately owned, and primarily civilian in use. I actually prefer the, uh, I forget who, whose definition this is, but cyber as collective hallucination. I think that's, that's a lot better as a, <laughs> as a definition. So we know and define what the medium is. We know what cyber attacks that would nece necessitate at least military attention, if not military response. Um, what animal of an, of an attack that is. It's not just a nuisance or a petty crime, um, but actually, uh, uh, but as far as like the spectrum, that's where we have trouble with. Um, there are, and, and again, uh, Professor Rowe kind of took some of my thunder talking about politically coercive acts. That actually is, is the bulk of unregulated cyber war. And I think Dr. Tadeo in the Rome conference that preceded this particular iteration of the workshop really did a good job of um, elucidating all the gray area of cyber attacks that, you know, they don't quite reach the, th the threshold of IHL. So they're just kind of there in the ether. And what do we do about that? So there is no disagreement generally that the authoritative ambit of IHL is triggered if there are people getting hurt or killed. Nobody, I mean, the Talon Manual is really good about that. This is. If there's this sort of damage, then yes, you've triggered, triggered the law of armed conduct. Uh, if, if this has happened, if there's blood on the ground, obviously it's an armed attack. And I've got 10 minutes, so I've got to keep this moving. <laughs> um, so let me focus on the things that are a little more important. So what should we hang our hats on when we're trying to define cyber weapons? Is it the physical nexus of the cyber attack? As one commentator put it, every Trojan horse had to come out of the shop, right? Is it the actual 
hardware involved in the cyber weapon, the laptop that was used to launch the attack, the mal malware that was uh, launched? Is it the line of code that was edited and revised? And by the way, lawyers um, are trying to parse whether we should review every potential revision of the code as a new quote unquote weapon that must remain IHL compliant. Uh, and what of the panoply of different civilian or non-military objects that are used to wreak, wreak havoc all in one coordinated incident? Let's say you've got cell phones and traffic lights and someone uh, uses their civilian plane's entertainment console to hack into avionics. I mean, what, where, is, um, where is the nexus that we're looking for here? Should we hinge legal and ethical review on the methods rather than the hardware? Um, this is where the indirect and decentralized nature of the cyber domain vexes our traditional analysis of war and confounds these traditional kinetic law of war analogies. So another idea is do we just live with an ad hoc dynamic definition since everything in cyber keeps continually changing and make it more consequence based as Professor Schmidt has um, argued in the manual um, looking at the effects, an effects based approach. And how do we take into account the you know, aforementioned gray area where it's politically coercive, the incident in question, yet currently has not risen to meet the threshold of use in bellow coverage? Should we just devise an entirely new category of cyber attacks that are not necessarily lethal, but just coercive on a grand scale, the so-called bloodless weapons? There are some good law review articles on that. Um, or is it more ethical to just keep this gray area of incidents outside of IHL coverage and uh, just keep it out of IHL's protective reach altogether? So and we've seen a lot of these similar debates. If you followed the law uh, of armed conflict, the uh, non-international armed conflict debates around drone, drone warfare, it seems that every time we have a new technology, people start looking more, more closely at, at um, IHL and saying, well, does this exactly fit? you know, maybe we should rethink these autonomous weapons. So this is not exactly new, but the dynamic nature of cyber just exacerbates the issue. Um, and, okay, I'm gonna skip over some of this stuff. <laughs> and so this is very interesting. I think this is, this is worth talking about. A lot of nations are thinking about a more content-based standard for cyber weaponry. And uh, if, if you were kind of brought up in a Western democracy, this is kind of, uh, it, it's hard to wrap your head around the idea that usage of Twitter or Facebook or um, YouTube could in effect have uh, eff the effects of being in the aggregate politically uh, coercive or have propagate some sort of political instability. So you get, the, you get this kind of tension in that, um, what was I gonna say? Sorry, I'm on slide. So, okay, I'm gonna be c completely fair to these nations and be nomadic in thought for a moment and entertain that view regarding content-based weaponry. Um, if you were to somehow, as another nation state, have a sustained and persistent propaganda campaign in the cyber do domain and affect their you know, grand strategy in some way, and have unprecedented intrusiveness in some way, the speed of dissem dissemination of the message and the intrusiveness being in people's homes is quite unprecedented. So this idea of information warfare, um, which was touched on briefly yesterday, it's a fascinating quandary because it goes well beyond just degre degradation and destruction and blood on the ground or just run of the mill intelligence collection. There was a controversy, for instance, uh, this is a civilian private sector company um, that changed just the color of its news feed to alter, to see if they can alter the emotions of their user base. Just a certain, they had a control group and they had a certain group that they changed the color uh, of the news feed for and they wanted to see if that would in fact make them more depressed. Can you imagine if as nation states they were one day able to use similar research and devise similar instruments to so, you know, infect, so to speak, that nation's populace and subtly affect political change without a single shot being fired or a bomb dropped. So 
beyond this individual content and propaganda and small scale tactical issues, let's examine grander strategic effects of cyber instruments with a content based focus. Let's say one nation state endeavoring to remove an undesirable political actor or despot devises a code that tampers with another nation's electronic voting machines. So your patently Klauswitzian political outcome can be achieved without putting boots on the ground at all or incurring costs in human life. In fact, there's growing scholarship showing that, uh, or people arguing that uh, this is actually a more ethical way of doing war. But is that really a cyber weapon? How, where are we gonna draw the line here? If we, if we extend our, if we broaden our definition, how, um, if we go down the way of, well, this is a halal internet, as Iran calls it, or this is, it, it's, it's again, it goes back to what my colleagues were saying about you have to sort of marry the interest with the stakeholder in a certain way. There are all these people around the Internet Governance uh, Roundtable and the IHL Roundtable, and everybody has a different view, and we're all talking across each other because we have a different lexicon. Um, let me try to skip ahead to the video. So, uh, weaponized code, that's an obvious possible cyber weapon, right? Um, the, th and this is a really serious issue that's different for cyber. The military, for the first time, I argue, does not have a monopoly on cyber weapons. In this realm, you simply can't count on, maintain, or promise that a traditional monopoly on destructive weaponry will stay within the military domain. Just to give you a benign, easily accessible, and open source example that I'm allowed to give you, you can go on YouTube right now, which is... You can search for whatever First worm. Thing we need to do is we go ahead and load our Metasploit framework console, which we've got loaded here. Then I'm going to use the multi You can basically design, watch someone redesign, tinker with, reverse engineer weaponized code that's already been released out into the ether. So if you so desire, whether you're a bad faith actor or simply curious, you can spend endless amounts of time learning, perfecting, and innovating on all of this with the help of, as you can see, a step-by-step -step tutorial and a demonstration. So there are a few more examples I want to give you, but I think I, I'm using up most of my time. <laughs> um, let me skip ahead to what, why I think, and I can always elaborate later on during discussion. These, this is why we're in new territory with cyber. This is an open source weapon and for the reasons I just explained to you. And this is just one very easily accessible um, example of how you can just go online. And as uh, Professor Rose's slide from early, earlier explained, this is what weaponized code looks like. This is, you can learn this stuff. Um, and it has unprecedented temporal ambiguity in the sense that you, if you have enough patience, you can design something that is, is a slow burn sort of situation. And you'll never quite know, if, if you're good enough at this, the, the nation state in question will never quite know if that's just hardware failure or if it's you know, an actual cyber attack. The multiplicity and diversity of bad actors and adversaries is, is unprecedented with cyber, as are the unwitting mercenaries. Just look at botnets. You can actually go out and buy a botnet service if you so desire to. Uh, and you could be part of a, I'm going to conclude, <laughs> you can be part of a botnet and not even know it if you have an unprotected machine. Accountability and attribution for all the um, conflict typology reasons. If you don't know who's doing the attack and for what reason, you don't know if there's a political aim, is it really an attack or is it a crime sy syndicate or is it you know, a hacker collective? The confused stewardship of norms for all the reasons that my, my colleagues have um, discussed. Uh, it, it's, it's kind of a problem that we don't have a regulatory body to talk about all this at this point. Um, the gray area of political coercion for all the reasons that Dr. Tadeo so expertly um, explained in the Rome conference. The civilianization of the war effort is a big deal because we rely on civilian expertise and 90% of military communication travels across um, civilian networks and infrastructure and for the same reasons that people are queasy about um, civilians being uh, involved in autonomous weaponry and drones, people are queasy about what the slippery slope is of having so many people involved in, uh, so many civilians involved in cyber war. 
Um, foreseeability, again, it's an issue. The pre uh, prescience is prologue, but we have people, especially older folks at institutions like the Pentagon who are so um, steeped in the Soviet uh, state versus state large scale war mentality. And the radio silence of states, I'll conclude with that. The problem with cyber war um, in terms of a norm formation viewpoint, in terms of developing IHL norms going forward, is that nobody is saying anything. Nobody has, to date, talked about IHL or referenced IHL victims and aggressors. And the only way that we can have norm form formation and laws developing is state practice and nobody's saying anything. That cuts across every other aggressive method and every ag other aggressive um, destructive weapon the military has used to date. So um, that is my attempt to succinctly.